the first thing that I'll talk about is sort of cancer imaging. What we're interested in here is to say, from, a, from an actual image that someone takes, can we tell if and when someone is diagnosed with cancer? Potentially a few months, but really years in advance. We do this for lung CT, uh, for lung cancer, breast cancer from mammography, and more recently, prostate with MRI. But that's about modeling diseases. Now, if you want to model sort of the treatments that can cure these diseases, you have to talk about chemistry. And chemistry is a very large and diverse space. And yet, within this large space, we would like to find the one thing that can potentially be therapeutic. And now, when we talk about chemistry, we have to think, well, chemistry exists within some context. And the context usually is a biological system. And so then we have to think about biomolecules, things like proteins and peptides. And we have to develop approaches to, to model these things. So I'll just go one by one. If we talk about cancer imaging, typically we think about cancer risk. So what is the likelihood that someone will be diagnosed with cancer within some number of years? We might collect some data like this. You have patients. Retrospectively, we would know sort of what their outcomes were. Maybe someone got cancer within three years. Someone did not at all. Someone cancer within five years. And the idea is, can we build like a model that sort of relates these to one another? Right? From an image, can we tell when and if someone will be diagnosed with cancer. What's the point of this? Well, let's say you do this, and then successfully, potentially you can have something more of a personalized screening regime. So traditionally, you would go in every you know, one size fits all. You go in every year. Everyone else goes every year. But if you have a model that can do this a bit more intelligently, potentially, if you're at low risk, you can skip a year. And if you're at high risk, you should probably come in earlier. So now you have a dynamic way of screening people for cancer. And <laughs> One is sort of depends on your risk, and two is also is more efficient in terms of the benefits or harms of screening. So we did this, and for breast cancer, we have a model called Mirai a few years ago that now sort of has been validated in seven different institutions across five countries. And here, what we see are sort of the sort of discriminative ability of this model to predict cancer within five years, breast cancer within five years. And so this was a very large scale sort of validation. The model was already trained um, at this point. For lung cancer, we do something similar with a model called Sybil. But instead of taking sort of a mammogram, now we take a CT, which is a 3D volume. And we run through the CT. And at some you know, time t0, we'd like to predict what will happen in the future. In this case, we find that two years later, in the same sort of spot, someone is diagnosed with a uh, lung cancer. But that's not obviously the end of the story. For this to be useful, it has to actually be used in a clinic. Uh, and in case for Mirai as well as Sybil, prospective trials are starting. This is just a brochure from uh, Tijuana in Mexico of a hospital that's using it now, um, at least as part of a large scale prospective study. So that's on the disease side, right? But we want to actually now try to have some chance of treating disease. Well, now we have to think about chemistry and the molecules that we use and we take in every day. Let's take antibiotics just as an example. You want to be able to find a new best antibiotic, especially with this sort of world of resistance. You would maybe collect a data of drugs. For each drug, you know whether or not it's a good antibiotic. And then you'd have some list of sort of molecular features, right? We want to find what are the features that are correlated with um, antibiotic activity and those that aren't. And so you want to have a molecule. From that molecule, you would so go just you know, one by one. Does this sort of motif structural, you know, group exist within this my molecule, maybe so. You go one by one, and you would sort of just jot them down in some vector. And that's traditionally one way of saying, here's a sort of feature vector for my drug. But one of the things that we're interested in, obviously, is can we do this a bit more automatically, and a bit more intelligently? So if you have the drug, which takes on some particular structure, either a 2D structure or a 3D structure, can we develop models that sort of learn from the structure alone the type of properties that are relevant to this drug. The molecule could be it's antibiotic activity. It could be something else, so whether it's soluble or not. And so here, for instance, a graph neural network can model and traverse a graph that sort of represents your uh, molecule of, of interest and try to predict whether or not it is antibiotic. Again, in this case, we're learning the features rather than us dictating what they should be. And you know, again, let's say you do this, you might collect 2,500 sort of molecules where you know sort of whether or not they're good against E. coli or bacteria. And then you train your model on that. 
Then you take your model and then you test it out on, let's say, 10,000 sort of molecules that are separate, uh, you've never seen before, but you do all of that on a computer. You don't have to do any experimentation at this point. And then you pick the top 100, you test those out in a Petri dish, and potentially you might find 51 hits. Right? Now we do some just sanity checks. You don't want something that's toxic to the human body. It's toxic to the bacteria, of course. You also want it to be something of a structurally novel molecule, because if it's something that already exists, you might be rediscovering the wheel. And if you do all this process, you might find a molecule that you might call halicin. In this case, halicin, you would find is a sort of a good drug against E. coli, the thing that you trained on, but also could go against two other types of bacteria that have some resistance. And this was sort of work done uh, with friends in like BE, also finding a new, for the first time, using deep learning to find a new antibiotic. So that's some modeling chemistry, right? It models a bit of the disease, a bit of the chemistry, but the chemistry obviously does not exist alone. It exists within some context. And so we have to think about modeling proteins and the context in which these molecules exist. So in a normal case, you know, things working out in a body, everything's fine. A protein is functioning normally, you have controlled cell growth, no abnormalities there, right? The minute you have a few mutations, potentially now you have a disease. In this case, for this particular protein, you have uncontrolled cell growth, and that's something you would like to sort of address. And the molecules that we've been talking about, these drugs, they have to have some particular shape, they have to have some particular conformation that fits in sort of in the pocket such that it inhibits the, whatever potential protein is doing, right? That's the idea of all, potentially a lot of drugs. So, but how do we do this, right? How do we actually model this thing, this interaction between the protein and the small ligand, such that we know whether or not we have a good drug? Well, that's where another sort of work that we've been interested in comes in, and this is based off of you know, the hype around diffusion, but applied to chemistry. So assume you have a protein, in this case, sort of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, and then some small molecule, and you want to be, be able to tell exactly where that small molecule fits within the large sort of space of the protein. And so what you take is you take the same molecule here, just shown in all different random spots around the protein, and you want to learn to iteratively sort of move that protein around, twist it, um, reshape it such that it sort of fits back into the right pocket that it should be in. And you train a model, a diffusion model that does this, so it changes all the torsional angles, moves it around, and you can over time learn to just sample, put, it, put a molecule somewhere around the protein, and it will find the right pocket for it. So that's what the students in our group call diffdoc. And if I, and you see diffdoc here, one, not only beating existing methods um, by a significant margin, but also actually being the first deep learning method that is better than physics-based methods, which you would imagine has been the, you know, the sort of status quo for a long time. And so we talked about you know, chemistry, biology, and uh, the diseases themselves, but that's really just a beginning, and there's um, quite a lot yet to come. Thank you.